What I'll do just to get us started. Oh, you start. Hello, we're on Periscope. Okay, well, we're just gonna we're gonna start. We're gonna wait for a minute uh, as folks come on in. We have a great. We have. Uh, you want me to stop it? No, it's fine. It's fine. That's fine. This is this is Periscope. Uh, we have an awesome conversation uh, today with uh, Michelle Higgins, Howie Malosh, and Greg Howe. I'm gonna have them uh, more in depth introduce themselves in a minute. But we want to welcome those of you who are here at Urbana, who are enjoying. Um, we're 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 just halfway, a little more than halfway through the conference, but um, you're you're pressing in. And for those of you who are watching, hashtag Urbana15 at home. We want to welcome you. Thank you so much for those of you who've been tuning into our Periscopes. Um, and those of you who might be stumbling in and wondering what the heck this is. This is the Urbana Student Missions Conference here in St. Louis, Missouri in the U.S. Uh, where we have 16,000 young people who are trying to learn what does it mean for them to uh, follow God's heart in serving the world and bringing hope and the good news of Jesus to the world. So uh, this afternoon we have an awesome uh, panel of speakers that we wanted to have a conversation with. Um, and so I'm gonna invite them to introduce themselves. So uh, thank you all for coming on in. Uh, please share this with others because this is gonna be a good conversation. Um, you can swipe up on Android or you can swipe to right if you're iOS and just press share and share this with your followers because you're not gonna wanna miss this conversation. So um, I'm gonna invite my, uh, my guests just to share a little bit about who they are, a little bit about their background, and then could you share what is one thing that God is doing in you uh, this week at Urbana? My name is Michelle Higgins, and I am delighted to work for South City Church. It's in St. Louis. I'm born and raised here. And so I work as their music and worship director, and I work as their outreach and advocacy director. And I'm the director of Faith for Justice, a Christian advocacy group with my brother, Howie. And we're excited to be at Urbana here. I have felt unity so deep, the sharing of stories, so entering into each other's stories, it actually enriches my own personal, my individual identity, knowing that I am one small piece of God's great mosaic. That's been really powerful for me. And uh, can I look at you, Andy? You or? can look at me or you can look at the camera. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Howie uh, Malosh, and I am on staff in St. Louis, Missouri with InterVarsity. I've worked with InterVarsity for 18 years and I live here. I oversee InterVarsity's work in Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. And uh, one thing that's been significant for me at Urbana is at Urbana 96, I was uh, 1996, for those of you who haven't been born yet. Um, I was a senior in college and Urbana was key in me turning my whole life over to God's global mission. And so, being back here is just reminding me about that, and today, as David Platt shared about giving your whole heart to Jesus, I think I was just compelled again. Um, also, I have some several really close friends and family in the audience, and it's been a significant conference for them, so that's been very meaningful for me. Hi, my name is Greg Howe. I'm uh, Vice President with InterVarsity and Director of Campus Engagement. Uh, and since we're doing older Urbana stories, so um, this conference confirms uh, one of the lessons I learned at Urbana 87, long before many of you were born, I suspect. You were born though, right? I was born. Excellent. I wouldn't even ask for sure. By 87? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I was born too. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were all born. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we are both. I, I remember um, I went to Urbana 87. Uh, I'm Chinese American, and my parents were like, Why are you going to a missions conference? You aren't going to be a missionary, you're going to be a doctor. Um, no surprise. And I said, but university students go, I want to at least hear at one point in life a clear call to God's global mission. And so I went, and the anxieties of my family were, well, if you become a missionary, uh, what will it cost your children and your grandchildren in terms of lost opportunities, of inadequate funding, etc.? And it was a throwaway line from uh, uh, YWAM leader, uh, Floyd McClung, who said, you know, missionaries have always buried their children on the mission field. And I remember all of a sudden it hit me, as a Chinese American, my family heard the gospel because some other family, probably from Europe, was willing to sacrifice and probably did bury their children on the mission field so that my people could hear the gospel. And it completely changed my sense of um, if other people were willing to risk so much so that I, my family could hear the gospel, how could I possibly withhold from God everything of mine? in the hopes that other people hear the gospel. And I think um, or every Urbana that I've been to, and this is my 10th or so, uh, has reminded me um, of God's beauty, of the 
beauty of the gospel and of the invitation by a very generous God that uh, he's worthy of our whole lives and that um, our greatest joy will come as people give their lives to Jesus. Well, again, if you're joining us, uh, we are uh, live here at the Urbana Student Missions Conference. Um, if you're watching live on Periscope, we want to invite you to uh, write questions that you might have for any of our guests. Uh, write them in the chat window, and Steve, who's behind the camera, will be sure to ask our panelists uh, the, that question. Um, like us, share us on Twitter and Facebook, and um, I just want to ask a question maybe for Greg, who's been to many Urbanas. What is, what is uh, for those who are either here at the conference or those who are watching at home, what is the vision of Urbana? What's the purpose? Why do we do this crazy conference every three years? Yeah, um, the first Urbana was in 1946 in Toronto, and at that point, uh, the president of InterVarsity said, the goal of Urbana is to raise up a missionary movement among college students to take the gospel to all people. And in, after 24 Urbanas and 75 years, that purpose hasn't changed. Our goal is to call this generation of college students to give their whole lives to Jesus so that they become servants of his in the task of world evangelization. And um, so to do that, we have consistently called them to follow the Lordship of Christ wherever he leads, to engage in costly cross-cultural mission and self-sacrifice, um, to be engaged in evangelism, and then to speak the gospel in both word and deed everywhere they go. And so uh, every decade is a little different with Urbana because we're trying to meet the needs of this generation in this context, um, but the core purposes haven't changed. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that. I mean, all three of you are intimately engaged with what young people are dealing with and trying to mobilize young people. And um, here at this conference, we have 16,000 mostly college-age students. So um, from your particular ministry and leadership experiences, what what are young people facing and what, what are we trying to do to equip young people into God's mission? I like when he says young people. It's, it's as if he isn't. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I, I mean... To me, it feels like one of the things that young people are facing right now is uh, the world is in a lot of turmoil. And um, I mean, you see it every time you open up your Facebook feed, and and it pretty much they're kind of there's a dividing line on Facebook. And so your certain one certain friends believe this way, one certain friends believe this way, and you kind of you just sort of unfriend the people that you don't you don't quite agree with, that you think is a little bit off, and then you friend people that you kind of agree with, and then you just kind of read that stream, and. Uh, I think students are trying to understand what does it look like to try to use um, their commitment to Jesus to understand the world and what their place is in it, and how do they, how do you begin to have a conversation about really complex, difficult issues that exist on campuses, in the cities around campuses, that exist in our country, that exist around the world, and also how do you hold the amount of pain and suffering that we hear about and we experience on a daily and a weekly basis. I mean, it's just, the, when I was a student, I, mean, I got my first email when I went to college, but I never emailed anybody because I didn't know, I didn't know anybody <laughs> else who had an email. Yeah. Like, and so, but now, in instantaneous fashion, we hear and we see what's happening, and I think there's just a sense of hopelessness to what, what, what is happening in our world. And so, so it feels like this is, uh, that's one of the things that students face, or maybe a lot of things, I think I said a lot of things. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's just that, that general thing about how do you, and then what does your faith have to do with that stuff? And, and our parents never faced that. They didn't face the, the kind of exposure and the kind of conversations that these students are facing. So it's a new generation. In a lot of ways, there are so many different levels to what students face. The first um, that I've noticed a lot is how do I apply this story of the Bible to my everyday walk? So I need to take what scripture says and rub it on my feet somehow, on my hands and on my mouth somehow so I can live out this story that's so beautiful to me, but I, I don't quite know how to connect what's kind of an ancient as parables or ancient narratives. I want to connect that to what's going on today, to what I'm seeing in Paris and Syria and San Bernardino today. And I think what Urbana is doing, what the personnel, the staff, the special guests, oh my goodness, the platform speakers, what they have done is they are living out the story. They are bringing the story out and interpreting God's story in a way that says, even through all of history, 
the fundamental, these principles have not changed and they haven't changed for little boys and girls. They haven't changed for 20 somethings. They haven't changed for older <coughs> folks. So what I love about the generational connections of Urbana, especially you guys' stories, is that these same messages are coming. You have to lay down everything that you want to hold dear in order to truly know what security is. And that's what I think the turmoil of going through your 20s or from your late teens, good Lord, into your 20s, that's what it's really about. You're looking at how the world churns. You're looking at how your own heart is churning. And the last thing you wanna do is open up and be vulnerable and lay down everything you're trying to control. But that's what Urbana is teaching them. And I, I love it and I think that they're really being fed. Yeah, yeah. And so this week at Urbana, we've talked about a lot of different issues. We've talked about uh, the persecuted church. Last night, we spent time praying for the persecuted church around the world. We've talked about unreached and unengaged people groups. And we've talked about racial crises that we're facing here at home, on college campuses, in our cities. Um, and why do you think it's important for young people to understand these issues or for people watching? Why, why is it important as college students to engage with these issues? And then how do you hold those issues together when you have stuff happening on the other side of the world, stuff happening right in your own city, stuff right in your own college campus. How do you hold those issues together? I, I love my brother. I love my brother. Hey, my brother. I don't think you're watching Periscope, but if you are, Mike, that's amazing. So <laughs> share it with a friend. Um, but I remember my brother said that um, he's, he's the most generous person that I know. And I remember he, when people ask him, how, how do you get so generous? He said, start now. If you want to be generous in 20 years, start today. And this, we, we tell students this all the time, like if you want to start something in your life, you have to start right now in the context and the space that you're in. So for me, these issues connect because how can we care about something thousands of miles away and think we're going to be engaged in healthy cross-cultural connection, we're going to be able to empathize with the pain and suffering of people that we're engaging with, we're going to be able to live out Jesus' gospel if we can't do it on our own campus. We can't do it in our own city. So for me, there's like there's this connection with we're trying to help students to think about how do I not apply Urbana in 20 years, but how do I apply it when I go back home and then when I go back on campus and continue? Because we want their whole life to be given to God's global mission. And that whole life is, you know, the entire being, but that starts now. That starts in the way that they engage with the stadium uh, servants and lead people who are serving with us. That starts when they're engaging with people on the street as they're walking out of Urbana, as they're talking with the people in the restaurants. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is when they're dealing with undocumented um, students that are on their campuses and black students that walk across their campus and get profiled because they're black students even though they go on the campus and they get stopped. So it, it all, it's, it's, it's all kind of interconnected. I think if you want to be faithful in, in other spaces where you're outside, you know, of your own country and other things, you have to start in this, this spot where, you, where God has placed you. God has a mission for you right now, right in the space that he has you in. Um, and so I think that's, that's sort of how I see it connected and, and how, why we need to talk about things that are happening locally, things that are happening globally, um, and, and mixing those together. Um, I think students have to engage it because um, they need integrity when they worship. Hmm. So, if you're going to sing about, oh, how God loves us, yeah. and simultaneously you can't hold in your mind 1,500 children maybe dying of hunger while I sing the song, mm -hmm. right? Um, nine suicides may be attempted. Um, somebody will be unjustly stopped and frisked a few blocks away. If you can't hold both of those at the same time, then Karl Marx was right, right? That religion told these the opiate of the masses and it's designed to dull us from the reality. But in fact, if the gospel is true, then we should proclaim the glory and the goodness of God simultaneously seeing the brokenness of the world around us and then interceding that he acts and then asking for the privilege of the church to be the agents of that, right? And so I think unless college students engage hard issues, the persecuted church, uh, racial divisions in the United States, the reality of world hunger, right? I mean, any of those issues, um, they're just fooling themselves, right? Religion is really just the equivalent of doing drugs. It's narcotizing them from the world. And so I think for integrity's sake, college students have to engage. And I think it is. It's overwhelming yeah. on how do you manage it all. I'd suggest 
um, grace is needed, right? You have to have grace for yourself. You can't possibly engage in every issue, and so many students um, want to be activists about anything, but the reality is many of these issues will require years of study and engagement to have relationship, to have understanding, to have impact. Um, I think uh, it means great we have grace for one another, that some of us will work on some issues primarily, and others of us will work on other issues primarily, and we're gonna give ourselves grace because we're part of the body of Christ. Right? We all cannot be a hand. And so there's a little bit of grace on that. And I think what we hope happens at Urbana is people's hearts are enlarged and they know, I do care about all of these issues. And part of what I'm asking is, what particular areas God has asked me to put my primary emphasis? While I have enough sensitivity to these other areas, um, to pray, to support other people, doing it, to bless my brothers and sisters who are doing work that I may not be primarily called to do. But I do think, um, a little grace and humility would go a long way. Well, they answered completely. I was, I mean, just now I was thinking, ooh, if we could only see the beauty of partnership, and even the way the afternoon seminars are set up, you go to global issues or the poverty track, you're already making a choice, right? And that is choosing which piece of the body you're going to be active in, right? And so that's the beauty that holds it all in tension because not all of your friends are all going to be on the track that talks about Iran, totally. You're going to have friends who are dealing with Mexico, friends who are dealing with Ferguson, friends who are going out to see what's going on in California and in Toronto. You are going to have partnerships, and that is exactly what the Book of Acts displays. Yep. Um, most of Paul's letters display that. Um, in fact, we have it in the Old Testament where Jethro came and said, Moses, you are crazy. Get you some elders. You cannot do it all. And that's, um, Urban is actually preaching that good news of partnership in simply setting up the conference. So that's how we hold those tensions together. The reason that I see college students must be involved now, especially with cleaning up the shores that they are from, before they depart those shores to go serve others is because telling the whole truth in my story is the only, only way I'm going to be able to be truly empathetic to someone else's. So what was the rubric that Evelyn gave us? Empathy is that I feel. You, I, you feel that I feel what you feel. Right? Yes, That's right. You want to make sure that those you serve, that they know that you relate to them with exactly what they're saying to you. And I, I really think that without the purification of a narrative of repentance, we can't have that. And so I see future justices of the peace. I see future lawyers. I see future healthcare professionals who will do their jobs righteously in a holy way, in a way that brings justice about because they showed up at however many Urbanas and were told, you know your own need. Bring your story to the cross. Bring your story to the empty tomb. Ooh, and lay it down and know that now you're living God's story. And they're able to do that with so much more grace and a lot less tension. And that gives them tons of space to love other stories too. Yeah, so uh, we're here on Periscope. If you have any questions for our panel, please uh, type them in. Um, and we're talking about partnership. We're talking about listening and empathy with one another. And here at the Urbana Student Mission Conference, uh, two days ago, uh, we had an opportunity uh, to enter into the story of the African American experience. Um, and Michelle uh, gave us a powerful word. We got to sing uh, gospel music and not just enjoy it, but actually enter in and hear from uh, two phenomenal worship leaders, Shadrach and Craven Rawi, who taught us and led us into the experience of gospel music. So I wanted to ask our panel, why at a student missions conference, why was that night, uh, you know, for you shared with us, and for all of us, why was that night important, and why was it significant to have at a missions conference? I find it was significant in part because African Americans, like many ethnicities who were created through oppression, so just dealing with our story, right? Um, African Americans, one of the few ethnicities that has been crafted, has been molded by captivity, being stolen from the shores of Africa, taken around the world, and some of us ending up in the U.S., um, an ethnicity that grew from 
the enslavement of people actually is a testimony to global mission. It is a testimony to the potential redemption God shows in the midst of a bloody, depressing history. Because what has happened with African Americans, the biggest stories of freedom in the United States have come from African American spirituals. The most engrossing descriptions of Old Testament history and um, even prose that comes out of the Old Testament is the idea that Moses and the children of Israel, everybody tells that in the context of Go Down Moses, an old gospel song. So one of the most interesting things about connecting the black experience to the global experience is that were it not for a sordid, albeit distracting and depressing history, there would be no black America. So what do we do with it now? How do we redeem this story? How do we see redemption in this story? One of the ways that we do it is we amplify it and we tell the story in more and more places until people are able to realize and not get comfortable with, but really be honest about the darkness in most of our pasts. There's darkness in pretty much every piece of history. And so to affirm on this in this space that around the world people can connect with what something that seems American actually is much more global than we think. So to me, missions, African Americans really are hand in hand. I mean, I think the other reason we were choosing to tackle at a global missions conference is um, the, the, um, the assumption in mission is that Christians are called to proclaim the gospel in word and deed um, wherever the gospel is uh, unclear um, unfaithfully lived out or unknown, right? And so it's obvious overseas when you talk to an unreached people, about an unreached people group, they don't know the gospel at all. So we joyfully can send people there. Um, we think about the persecuted church, and we want to declare that the gospel is real in those hard situations, so we're happy to send people there to ensure that those people also hear the gospel. And we'd say, locally close to us, there are communities which are so broken um, by sinful systems and sinful people that the gospel has to be proclaimed there. But that there's continuity between all three because all of them require somebody who knows the gospel and who is an adequate messenger of a gospel which requires repentance and the re um, reception of forgiveness to enter into a foreign culture to them, um, incarnate themselves, and then from there begin to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ has brought freedom from sin, freedom from captivity, forg right, forgiveness. and so. Um, I think it's all of a piece. Another way to look at it is um, this urban in particular is what Holly mentioned. Um, our, this student generation is so aware of the pain of the world. And we've talked a lot about um, how do you enter in the pain of the body of Christ. So there's been a huge emphasis here on the persecuted church. Um, similarly, the African American church here in the United States is in incredible pain because um, black people keep dying, right? Because black dignity is under assault. And so we're hoping to show to these students, um, it's easy to care about the persecuted church far away. Would you care about people who are experiencing pain and persecution locally as well? So that it's actually a logical extension of what we've been doing. And uh, Urban has been ta uh, tackling issues of racial justice for decades. Yeah, I, I, so I think there's a, probably a couple things why I think we need to engage with the truth. So we, we believe in the Imago Dei. Everyone is created in the image of God. What we see in the United States of America is that black people and brown people, Latinos, African Americans, you can go black diaspora, I mean, so lots of people, ethnic minorities, the spaces in America, they, they do not declare the value and dignity of those people groups. So there's, and there's microaggressions against Asian Americans and um, we've talked, I mean, there's, there's just, uh, there is in America a sense that your value is affirmed when you are white. And I am white. My value is affirmed when I go to the St. Louis Cardinals game and I see people in the audience that looks like me. My value is affirmed when I go to Walgreens and I try to shop for products to use for myself. My values affirm when I go to Bank of America and I can get a loan. My values affirm everywhere around my value is affirmed. And we don't see that 
in America for people of color. And this, again, it's not just with the African Americans experience that is significant and painful, and we've seen many killings and those things like that. But this is, so what I see of the Jesus I see in scripture is that he looks for those who are not affirmed and says, I am going to affirm. He was, he was born into a oppressed class of Jewish people under Roman authority. And we look and we're studying Matthew, we've studied John in previous times, that one of the first people he reveals himself through to miracles is servants who are making water into wine by the miracle that he does. Then he goes to the Samaritan woman, who's a hated person in her own community, and, to, and tells her that she has value in God's kingdom. I see Jesus going to the people right around him, going places where other people don't go and say, you have value. So to me, it feels like this is the story of the gospel, that God blesses particularized groups of people to be blessings to other to the nations. That's what I loved about what Michelle had said in her talk, was that she, in this talk, she said there's other people who suffer are, are suffering and in pain. We think of our Latino community in America and the amount of pain that they're facing in America. And to actually say, this is part of the kingdom. We care not just for our own needs, but the needs of others. So I feel like in a global mission conference, if we're not thinking about who are the people that are oppressed, that are feeling um, uh, their dignity is under assault, and that, like, it, why should they not be affirmed in a place like Urbana? Urbana needs to affirm the dignity and the value of black life, of brown life, of ethnic minority communities. Just for me, I don't, I'm not speaking for all white people, but my life is, is said to have value every day that I go down the street. So I, I can just say, I, I'm leaving it on the table. You don't have to say that. You don't have to say that for me. I got it. I got it. I got the message, okay? So that's one thing. The second reason why I think we need to talk about it in a global stage is that the world is watching the United States of America in this issue. I mean, you could see from what happened. I live in St. Louis. I've been in St. Louis for the last 13 years. I went to college in St. Louis before that. Um, no one in the world had ever heard of Ferguson, Missouri before August 10th, really. Right. August 9th was Mike, Mike Brown was killed. August 10th, 2014, everyone began to hear about Ferguson. And the world is saying, okay, here is America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, those who are bringing freedom and justice all over the world. What are they going to do when people say they are not free in the own land of, of the United States of America? What is America going to do about this? So the globe is watching. I would say that for me, again, the history of white Christian people around the world, a little bit mixed, not great, right? We've had some good things, some bad things. Um, so it feels like... We need some credibility. Well, we can need, I change the yeah, I, yeah. I think it's an integrity issue, right? So integrity, yeah. I, I'm a little less concerned with, um, so does America actually export justice? To me, the issue is in a country with so many churches, have we demonstrated mm -hmm. that God cares about all people, desires the gospel to be made present there, that it should transform our communities and unite us? Um, in Christ, right? So to me, it's an integrity issue, and I think people are looking at the North American church. Because in, in Canada, the question is, um, how is this being done with the Aboriginal peoples, right? So how does the North American church demonstrate that the gospel is a gospel of reconciliation now before we go overseas? Um, and if we lack that, I think the global church is asking and has asked, so how transformative is that gospel, right? And and maybe to, to modify a little the... Yeah. I do think Jesus affirms the existence of every culture and the dignity of every culture, and he invites every culture uh, to be transformed by scripture. Right, so, because I think some people here affirm, like, no matter what you do, it's all good, and I think actually the amazing thing, right, is that Jesus enters every culture, and scripture enters every culture, and you find things that um, scripture goes, this is God-given, it's part of you being made in my image, this is beautiful, and I want you to preserve it, and it should be valued and dignified, and every culture, has places where the, the scripture comes in and goes, this area, I'm gonna call you account to, yeah. right? Um, and you're gonna have to repudiate it and repent of it. And there's a promise of transformation. And I think, um, and I know you actually imply that, um, but as I think about people who've never thought through how scripture engages culture, there's deep yeah. affirmation of its God-given beauty. Yeah. And there's a clear critique. And I think part of why this conversation is so hard in the United States 
because the North American church isn't used to critique. Right? We're not used to actually being challenged because we think of ourselves as so Christianized. And what we're coming up against, I think, is a little bit of the hard edge of scripture where um, I think Jesus is saying, you know, um, a little bit like the letters to the seven churches of Revelation, I love these things about you, but this one thing I have against you, <laughs> right? One thing you lack, will you engage this one issue? And for the church in North America, racism is surely one of those courses, right? And we've challenged consumerism and other things as well. Our college students are uniquely aware of what's happening on campus today. Uh, of uh, racism, and so we thought it's important. Let's allow um, scripture's critique, right, of that to rise to the surface, so that the church could say, in Jesus, there's no Jew or Gentile, slave or female or female, but we're all one in Christ. That Christ has come to bring um, people who've been divided by hostility into one new body, and their one new body be um, reconciled to uh, God, right? In Ephesians two, um, that the image at the end of Revelation seven has meaning that we will all be gathered before the throne of God, worshiping together in all of our diversity and difference. And um, so we're, we're trying to pick up those themes from scripture. Yeah. I want to add, can I add no, just please, two, please. two brief encouragements quickly, both uh, from what both gentlemen were saying. One, the story, the story of Jesus as the center of my narrative. I always hold up the circle. I think it's um, Audre Lorde who um, had the circle of narrative of story and in the center is the truth the norm of story well the church has different norms and we all pick and choose what what is the story from which i experience everything but when we come into the family of god it is the gospel that is our new norm no longer my blackness as the center no longer my asianness or my whiteness or my indian Ness as the center or my nativeness as the center but the center is the gospel the story of Jesus and Jesus himself had a lot of trouble delivering the truth to his to his people he had a lot of trouble preaching truth to his own tribes as you will and he did it anyway Paul Timothy Barnabas name all the other missionaries after the resurrection and ascension those are the people that went on world mission, were they not? Mm -hmm. To Asia, to Africa, those are the people that went on world mission. The story of Christ, if it is my center, that I'm missing out on participating in his story, if I am not delivering truth to my people, to my own people. And that's why Urbana has to amplify the stories of looking around North America. If this is where we're based, if this is where a lot of our people are coming from. We have to tell the whole truth about what has happened in North America because that's what Jesus did when he was born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth in Egypt. He had to tell the truth to his own people, to the mm. Jews. That's what he did. And it's uncomfortable and they got mad and they did not like it. And I don't know why we should be surprised when we try to tell the whole story that it's uncomfortable and we get mad and we don't like it. So it's the first bit of encouragement. The second bit of encouragement is from Ephesians 2. So inspired by what you just said, Greg. Jesus himself, with his flesh, mm -hmm. tore down the wall of hostility. So his body, his body was the wrecking ball that destroyed the divisions between us that are creating stench after stench and murder after murder and outcry after outburst after disruption after protest. These divisions are not right. So we have to now, living as a continuation of his story, we have to take our bodies and make them the thing that tears down the dividing wall. If I am now sacrificing my norm, I'm giving my norm up. Who I am is actually enriched by the story of God. And who I know the Lord is leading me to be is being enriched by tearing down the walls of hostility between my brothers, male, female, between my friends who are Latino or are Asian, between all of the people that I would call my enemies. I need to take my body and destroy the dividing wall so that I can see them. What you're saying reminds me of the testimonies we heard um, when we prayed for the persecuted church. 
how many people were physically abused, and while they were being physically abused, asked if they could pray for their persecutors. Right? There were a couple. There were several testimonies like that, and I think what you're saying is the most, you know, a vivid example of right after you've beaten, threatened me, can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. And to be told as a as an Urbana a conference, uh, please pray for us, but also pray for those who persecute us. And there's something that they put their own bodies into. Yeah. Andy, we have a guest who has asked, what does Michelle do, and where, what campus is she a staff on? Oh. <laughs> Maybe to join in the after. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So why don't you fill us in, Michelle? So I'm not on staff. I am. I work at a church on the south side of St. Louis, and I do music. I love my job doing music. I direct a choir that's actually singing Sunday, January 17th. <laughs> if anybody's going to be around, um, I and I, I love it. And I'm also the director of a Christian activism group called Faith for Justice. Yeah, and so you know. Going back to this idea of like how it's hard to have this conversation, um, it's been challenging. And I even getting ready to talk to you guys, I was really nervous because I'm like, what if I say the wrong thing or ask a weird question? And uh, you know, but God has been really good. I mean, after Amen. after uh, I mean, throughout the night, particularly the night where you spoke, Michelle, um, after you spoke, there was just an outpouring of repentance and worship and forgiveness, and God is doing a, a good work. And, and even on social media, I'm part of the social media squad, we're hearing people that are being blessed by this, by watching online, people that are encouraged. Uh, but we're also hearing um, some, some criticism, some feedback, and some people that have been to past Urbanas, and they're like, why are we talking about this? And, and feeling very, the discomfort and dissonance. And you know, one of the common, uh, one of the things that I heard was like, why, why are we talking about liberal politics? Why don't we talk about the gospel? Why don't we talk about uh, missions? And so, um, why do you think this conversation is so hard? And what would you say to somebody who may be watching this at home and is concerned? Like, why, why is Urbana talking about this? What would, what would you be your response to that? So I, I think it's hard because we don't have it. I think part of the, just as we started before, um, on, our, on our Facebook feeds, or um, you, you, you have a very polarizing conversation, and you say one thing, and you just don't talk to each other. So I think it's difficult because we don't have a lot of practice to actually talk about real issues that are complex and that you, know, you actually have to engage in. And so Urbana is giving some language to people to actually begin to, to talk about you know, difficult things. I think that, that's what makes it, it's just, it's just difficult we haven't, we, because we have not been doing it. But I, I re, we need to be engaging in issues that are significantly impacting the people around us on our campuses. So I work on campuses where students feel these issues um, and they experience them on a day-to-day -day basis and so as I'm ministering on this campus how can I expect to, to minister and to care for the student if I can't understand where they're coming from what what what's happening in their lives and so I think that that's part of for me why we're engaging in this and, and it's just and why it's a bit of a hard conversation we did have a question a question for Michelle or Greg did you want to say well, something maybe you, you raised Andy the um, this is just a liberal p political thing. Right. Um, and I think my response would be, um, it grieves me that people perceive it as a political thing uh, when the scriptures are so clear mm -hmm. that God desires to reconcile all people, one to another and then to himself. That uh, people, are, the Christians are called to be um, reconcilers and peacemakers. And um, so uh, if it's a liberal political thing, I so wish the Christian church would say, no, it's our thing. Because the one unique thing that Christians have to offer in this conversation, or several of is uh, we actually believe forgiveness is possible. We believe transformation of hearts is possible, right? We believe um, transformation of communities is possible as the Holy Spirit begins to move. Um, the political activists don't have enough to offer the conversation. They can raise and make an issue. I think only the gospel actually has the power that transforms people. And so really what I want to say to people who are like, oh, it's just a political issue, well, then let's make it a church issue. Let's make it a Jesus issue and allow Jesus' um, light to transform it. And I think, you know, it, it's a hard conversation because it forces us to confront our own sin and our own brokenness. And nobody likes that conversation, right? Um, I, I, I don't get the, it's a political conversation, but when I teach on, um, you know, uh, sex at college campuses, none of those Christian students are like, oh, this is awesome, right? They're like, that was hard. <laughs> and what I hope they feel is, 
and we heard the words of life that give us hope and the possibility of transformation and forgiveness, right? Uh, so then we've already talked about why an admissions conference, um, because the world needs to hear gospel reconciliation. If you're in Rwanda or Burundi right now, you need to hear it. If you're in the Middle East at Syria or Turkey and you're a Kurd, you need to hear it. If you are in China and you're one of the 56 minority peoples in China, you need to hear it. We're doing this as a mission conference now because wherever the missionaries who leave Urbana, whatever country they go to, they desperately need a gospel of Jesus transforming people and systems and structures to be the kind of people, systems and structures that would please God. So the question for Michelle was, what is the church's place in the conversation about reparations? Well, y'all ain't playing with me <laughs> today, Lord. Dude, you're not screaming at me? <laughs> well, I will say that the conversation on reparations has to be entered into with grace. Is it one that should that should occur? You'll be really glad I'm not on staff of university <laughs> now. Um, but I do think there is space for conversation on reparations. I believe even the the disagreements <clears throat> about reparations going on around the world are worth paying attention to. And it's not political. Again, it's not political. It is telling the whole truth for the sake of a reconciliation that is not devoid of justice. We've done a lot of talk about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. It's more than a hug and a handshake. Right? It is counting the cost of returning to right relationship. It's counting the cost of getting to equity. And reconciliation means that those who have earned because others have suffered loss must now understand that equity means we suffer loss so that others might earn dignity. And so the church's place in the conversation on reparations is one of grace and repentance themselves it's also one in which we have to have enough patience with each other that when we disagree and when the cost gets counted and sometimes it feels too much for some to bear, we will stop and speak to one another and look at each other and say, reparations is actually holy. It is biblical. It's Old Testament stuff. It is actually holy. And in our context, how do we do it right? Our context how can we do it well? So the church's place is the church's place in every other conversation. It's the same as the church's place in the conversation on poverty, the conversation on imprisonment, mass incarceration. The church's place is at the center, demanding respect for all parties who disagree and coming to a place where peacemaking is our goal and equity and dignity is our goal. However, we have to achieve it, whatever we have to do. And the response was, thank you, Michelle, a very insightful response. Okay. Well, that was uh, fast. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. This will be our last question. And so for those of, who are watching, who are here at Urbana, or maybe folks who've been following along streaming, um, um, as we're getting ready to the, the last full day of Urbana and getting ready to go home, and we've heard all these talks, all these stories, all these issues, could you offer maybe an encouragement, um, some challenge or things? How can people start to think about applying this as they're going back to their campuses? and going back to their churches. Um, I think it's interesting that after raising all these hard issues, persecution, um, what's happening to black people in America and in Aboriginals in Canada, Canada um, I think it, it's so insightful of the conference planners to say, we're gonna spend tonight um, immersed in the crucifixion mm -hmm. and death of our Lord, right? Um, and then tomorrow we're gonna talk about the resurrection and God's call to go because um, it's really at the cross, right, where Jesus dies in our place and on our behalf, taking on the sins of the world unjustly to free us, uh, where God triumphs over death and evil, mm -hmm. right, uh, where resurrection happens. And then it's in light of that, of God's narrative. When he sends us to go, we're not going um, unarmed and ill-equipped, right? So one simple answer, because I know you guys will be more practical, um, okay. Is, um, I invite people watching, um, you know, on live stream or uh, students here, immerse yourself in the story of scripture that you're going to encounter. Because for 2,000 years, the church has come back to Jesus' death and resurrection. It's the absolute center of what we do and proclaim. And it actually gives us hope, right? You can face death and persecution if you believe yes, in the resurrection of the dead. You can face um, any sort of deprivation and 
want if you really believe Jesus Christ died in your place, um, naked, um, unjustly accused, and nailed to a cross. Um, and uh, if you really believe God said go, or invited us to go, then, um, you know, in this moment, sort of like ministry is going nowhere and it's really hard to go, but you called me and I'm going to trust you. So, I mean, just as I think about the program, um, finish the story of Jesus. So, um, I would just say that this is a journey. So, take the next step. That's right. So, ask God. And there's so much that's come in at Urbana. You watch the lives. I need to watch several of these talks over again. Mm -hmm. And to say, Lord, what is that one or two things that you're inviting me to do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And take the next step. What I see in Scripture is that God is committed to you and to pursuing after you and to helping you understand, to making you more and more like Jesus. And so, no, this is a journey. Um, I am 18 years in since that Urbana when I was a student, and it's been a, a day by day, a week by week, a month by month journey. So just give some grace. We talked about grace earlier. Give yourself some grace and just begin to take those next steps um, that you feel like he's calling you to. Uh, on the, I know that there's a lot of students who are thinking, how do I engage with the movement for equity, specifically race-based equity, one that would say every life is sacred, and that is an affirmation that God makes when he calls his creation good. So I would say self-education is really huge. You know, being able to read and absorb different authors. But there are yep. a few here this week. I mean, Christina Cleveland's book, well, any of them. They're wonderful. Brenda um, has a book, I think, Brenda Salter yep. McNeil. Room after reconciliation. I mean, just read that and then begin to absorb and then begin to discuss. We already talked that partnership is good. Talk to people who are doing things in other places. This is a place where I have to um, ask forgiveness constantly of myself. We talked about how we don't pray for the persecuted church enough. Shaylin said that. And I really resonated with that confession. And I have to confess that there are lines of division I need to cross with my brothers and sisters from different countries around the world. So can we confess that when we have brothers and sisters who may be of African or African American um, just said we need to confess, we need to get in touch with them a little bit more. So don't be afraid to self-educate and realize you're ignorant about something. It makes you human and it means there is space to grow in wisdom. The other big thing that I really appreciate from uh, our experiences is knowing our story and knowing that it is not finished. It's not written yet. You are a living epistle and the Lord is writing his letter on you even now. So please, please engage in prayer and engage in partnership on the other side and um, yeah, don't be afraid to say I don't have it all. I don't know it all yet because God's writing his letter on and a shout out to the uh, Urbana 9 and 12 alumnus who has been with us for most oh, of this time. Hey, Thank hey. you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And re remember, you could join us at www.urbana.org for our live stream tonight, uh, starting at uh, 7.15 Central Time and uh, all, the, all day tomorrow. And for those of you who are here with us, make sure you get good rest because tonight is going to be good. Um, I want to thank uh, my panelists, especially Michelle. Thank you for being here with us at Urbana and your ministry and your leadership. And uh, we're going to bring you more stuff on Periscope. So share this replay for others, and we will see you at our other Periscope events. Um, we'll do a pregame show at 645. So join us for our pregame show at 645. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you for the time.